and thank you for joining us at the Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers. This is our third book talk in our book talk event series. I am Indu Saxena, Deputy Director of the Consortium. For today's book session, we have Mr. Michael Karpan with us for his newly published book, Winning and Losing the Nuclear Peace, The Rise, Demise, and the Revival of Arms Control. This book is published by Stanford University Press. And it tells about the nuclear history, I would say the past, present, and a lot more to do for the future. This event is hosted by Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs. So before diving into substance, I would like to invite Director of the Consortium, Dr. Ernest Gunasekra Rockwell, for his opening remarks. Doc, over to you. Thanks, Indu. Uh, and, and thank you, Mr. Kreppen, for agreeing to join us here. Uh, you, uh, the, the, this series is all Indu's idea, and uh, she's done a great job in, in bringing uh, a bunch of the, the, the most respected folks uh, from their, their respective fields to talk about the books that they've written. And, and it's, it's very helpful for uh, you know, getting the word out about the books and, and the authors, but it's also very helpful for the consortium and in building our reputation for, for having interactions with the, the top scholars in the field. And we, we very much appreciate uh, Indu your efforts and also those of all the authors that have appeared on here. Uh, just a, a quick word about the consortium. We're, we're a, a 501c3 uh, uh, nonprofit organization, uh, all volunteer think tank at this point. And uh, we're affiliated with, but separate from the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs. Obviously we, we host a lot of events together and a lot of our uh, work that we do in the consortium is, is published in the, uh, the journal. Uh, but our, our folks do research across the, the Indo-Pacific up into the Arctic and, and uh, soon down into Antarctica as well. And uh, you know, they publish all over the place. So uh, um, you know, we're, we're very proud of the work that they're doing and uh, as epitomized then by, by the book series that, that uh, the book discussion series that, that Indu is doing. So again, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kreppen for being with us. And thank you, Indu, for, for doing such a fine job with this series. And I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Doc, for your positive and charming comments as always. Uh, before diving into the uh, substance, let me do uh, some housekeeping stuff. So please type your question in chat box and unmute mute yourself if you are not speaking. And the disclaimer here, the views and opinions expressed or implied in this event are those of the participants and should not be construed as carrying the official sanctions of the Department of Defense, Air Force, Air Education, and Training Command, Air University, or other agencies, or Department of the US government or their international equivalents. Mr. Kirpan is a very well-known and renowned in the subject. For me, he, I guess he needs no introduction. How would, however, I would like to take this opportunity and privilege to introduce him formally with our audiences and others who will be watching this video later. Mr. Kirpan is a co-founder and a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center. He served as Stimson's president and CEO until 2000. He is a prolific author, credited 20 to 22 books on his name as an author and editor. He worked previously in the executive branch and on Capitol Hill. He received the Kangi Endowment Award for Lifetime Achievement in Non-Governmental Work to reduce nuclear dangers in 2050. Since this is a brief bio, and if you want to know more about him, you can click on my story link at stimson.org. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Michael Kirpan for presenting a brief overview of his book. Mr. Kirpan, over to you. Thank you, Indy. And thank you, Doc. I think this consortium is a fabulous idea. Uh, I wish you all the best in um, the successes to come. My book is about the narrative arc 
of arms control, nuclear arms control. And it's a story about overcoming the great difficulties and achieving unexpected success. When the Cold War ended, all of the elements for a nuclear peace were in place. Uh, the United States and the Russian Federation didn't have anything to argue about when the Cold War ended. Borders were settled. Dangerous military practices that could lead to nuclear confrontation had ended. Nuclear force structures were greatly reduced. And even the most worrisome weapon in Cold War arsenals, the intercontinental ballistic missile that could launch many warheads uh, to travel great distances and attack separate targets in a matter of minutes. These weapons were um, banned by a treaty that was negotiated at the very end of the Cold War. There were no nuclear tests going on as the Cold War ended. And we had survived many decades without the battlefield use of nuclear weapons. So nuclear peace was at hand. And then from this pinnacle, we have fallen quite a long distance. Now, the United States and Russia are now in very fraught times as Russian forces are mobilizing and likely to grow around Ukraine's borders. There's a new player in nuclear and geopolitical competition, that's China. And there are great concerns about a clash across the Taiwan Strait and a clash of navies and air forces in the event of a contingency in which China's leader tries to extinguish Taiwan's autonomy. There are border clashes between nuclear armed rivals on the subcontinent, between China and India, between India and Pakistan, and these border clashes have uh, become increasingly worrisome. They stop and they start, they're intermittent, but they will continue. So the world, and of course, Iran, uh, freed of the constraints of a nuclear deal negotiated uh, during the Obama administration, is enriching uranium uh, and is now on the threshold of having sufficient stocks to have a small sized arsenal in just a short period of time. So the world is now in danger. The nuclear peace that we thought we had won in the Cold War, at the end of the Cold War, uh, is pretty hard to find right now. And treaties have gone by the wayside. They've been dispensed with as being inconvenient, as constraining freedom of action. So we're in a very, very rough period. And it's likely to last for some time. I end the book in trying to encourage new thinking about how we can reduce nuclear danger in the future. And I try to remind readers 
especially young leaders who are very uh, disheartened by where we are. I try to remind leaders that people were very disheartened during the Cold War also. We had some terrible, terrible decades during the Cold War. And yet we made it, we survived, we even succeeded. And I end the book on a hopeful note. I think we can succeed again. It's gonna be very hard, but if we have the willpower and we're smart about this, we can do it. Thank you, Mr. Capon, for your comments and for your insights. When I was reading the book, like uh, it tells me uh, about uh, the history, it describes about the history from from the Truman, from President Truman to the Trump. Like it's it's about the past and the present too, and it's as uh, uh, future aspirations. So someone who believes. I would say, as I said, the researcher, it's a very important book for the students, for the researcher and practitioner. And, uh, and to know about the nuclear history and also who believes in norms and to re reduce the nuclear danger. So I would uh, like to start with my first questions uh, about the nuclear peace. What, what is your definition of nuclear peace and what it entails in today's tense and conflictual strategic environment when we are seeing that more than 90,000 Russian troops are believed to be massed near Ukrainian's border. According to report and sources, the Moscow could planning the military offensive at the end of the January. And a kind of similar things could be said for South China Sea or invasion of Taiwan, or Galvan Valley in Eastern Himalayas? Well, the very basic and fundamental condition of nuclear peace is that rivals that possess nuclear weapons do not use them on battlefields. This is absolutely necessary for nuclear peace but it's insufficient. We need more than that. Since every nuclear test is a declaration of military utility for nuclear weapons, I think we also need a second norm for nuclear peace, not just no battlefield use, but a continuation of no testing. And both of these two central norms were utterly inconceivable uh, for every president from Truman uh, through George H.W. Bush. Uh, but now these norms exist and they are long lasting norms. They're the hardest norms to break. So both of these norms are necessary. They are still insufficient. Uh, another condition of nuclear peace is that states resolve not to wage aggressive war. That states accept the territorial integrity of their neighbors. Now, during the Cold War, this aspect of the nuclear peace was codified by something called the Helsinki Final Act. It was a, an agreement between the United States, the Soviet Union, and all the countries in between them in um, 1975 to respect the territorial integrity and national sovereignty of other states. So this critical piece of the nuclear peace is now endangered, as you just said, in uh, It's lacking. Another crucial element of nuclear peace is that states that possess nuclear weapons 
seek to avoid dangerous military practices. And there were agreements to do this between Washington and Moscow to avoid incidents at sea, to avoid dangerous military practices for ground forces and air forces that were operating in close proximity. And while these practices, dangerous practices, didn't entirely go away during the Cold War, they were greatly reduced. This piece of the nuclear peace has now been truly forsaken. And we're seeing dangerous military practices on disputed borders. We're seeing them in the South China Sea, in the Taiwan Strait, and we're certainly seeing them uh, around Ukraine at present. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you divided your book in three sections, Rise, Demise, and Revival. In your thought, what are the main factors that could be held responsible for demise? And what are the concerns that are delaying revival? Mm -hmm. When we are talking about uh, Moscow and Washington, uh, and uh, they are not uh, getting along with this. <laughs> They're not getting along into because we have very different views about the status quo. And Washington is very pleased with the status quo, at least in Europe, and also across the Taiwan Strait. But Russia is, and China is. And if the major powers are not all on board the status quo, then Houston, we have a problem. And we're witnessing this problem now. But as to your first question about what happened, why the demise happen? I think there were plenty of reasons. One reason is that Washington overreached at the end of the Cold War and indeed expanded NATO all the way to Russia's doorstep. And in George W. Bush's second administration, something we easily forget. He championed the inclusion of both Georgia and Ukraine into NATO. And he got NATO to reluctantly agree to this at a summit meeting in Bucharest during his second term. And this crossed a bright red line for Putin. And now he's clawing back. And he has disregarded the national sovereignty and territorial integrity of both Georgia and Ukraine. And he might well take another bite out of Ukraine, um, which poses a serious dilemma. Other things happened besides US overreaching as the Cold War ended. Um, bipartisanship pretty much ended with the Cold War. Uh, the Cold War was a bipartisan enterprise, um, resisting, containing, um, and in the case of Afghanistan, repelling Soviet ambitions. Uh, and bipartisanship faded quite quickly in the United States. And it just, it doesn't just apply to arms control. It applies right now to all, all too many things. I'm so sorry to say. Uh, and it weakens the United States when we're so internally divided. It wasn't just bipartisanship that ended with the Cold War. Equality ended with the end of the Cold War because the whole enterprise of arms control was built around the nominal equality, at least in strategic forces, between the United States and the Soviet Union. That was the only thing we were equal. 
And after the Cold War ended, a lot of people said, we're not equal anymore. But this whole enterprise that's built on equality no longer reflects reality and we don't need it. A third aspect of why arms control tumbled is because it was also built on mutual vulnerability. Mutual vulnerability allowed the United States and the Soviet Union to greatly reduce their strategic forces and to step away, to step back from the nuclear threshold. After 9-11, the United States, no president could operate on the condition, um, could make vulnerability a central element of US national security. So one by one, the props, the foundational elements of the practice of arms control got kicked away. And treaties were cast aside and now we have to rebuild. Yes, Mr. Kipan, you rightly said that we are in a serious dilemma. So when we talk about the Eastern Europe, the Russia, uh, Moscow says that don't cross the red line over there. He's just sending a kind of warning. And we are talking about, when we talk about the South China Sea, then the Beijing, and not only the South China Sea, but, but Eastern part of Himalayas, that's the, that's the territory belongs to India. So, and we are very sorry that we are divided. It's, it's a fact that we are. So I just, I'm curious to know about a, a, a question from history. Like uh, you have, you watched this and you, you have gone through that, all these process and procedures. So what was the reason behind the second term of President Nixon that uh, he made that uh, treaty or what's the, uh, was the uh, main reason was the Mikhail Gorbachev was there at that time? Well, the golden decade of arms control, at least in my reckoning, was between 1986 and 1996. Tremendous accomplishments, huge breakthroughs, utterly confounding achievements. But the achievements in that period, and I'll go through them, the, the achievements were enabled by all of the hard work that began before Gorbachev and Reagan met in Reykjavik in 1986. Um, treaties by President Kennedy, President Nixon. Very few people remember, and I had I had completely forgotten until I did my research for this book. Lyndon Baines Johnson achieved so much in this field. The Nonproliferation Treaty was negotiated on his watch, and he began preparations for strategic arms control. Um, Every president tried hard, starting with Truman himself, who, who tried to pursue abolition um, until it was clearly impossible. Uh, Eisenhower began the process of talking to the Kremlin. In his case, it was about surprise attack which was a big, big problem in the 50s. And also about nuclear testing. Every president throughout the Cold War contributed to this effort. But the great breakthroughs only occurred when Reagan was teamed up with Gorbachev. Both of these guys actually believed in abolition. They disbelieved in 
deterrence orthodoxy. And who knew? Who knew? Reagan's first term was just filled with crises and nuclear danger. And he realized this toward the end of his first term. And he was not a church going man, but he believed in scripture. And he was absolutely determined that Armageddon would not happen on his watch. But he had nobody to deal with in the Kremlin until Gorbachev came along. And they met at Reykjavik. It was a roller coaster ride. Many people thought it was a failed summit. It actually laid the basis, as had previous failures, diplomatic failures during the Cold War. It laid the basis for subsequent success. In 1986, the Soviet Union first agreed to on site inspections. It didn't have to do with nuclear issues, it had to do with confidence and security building measures in Europe. But then it was applied, on site inspections were applied to the nuclear arms disarmament agreement that Reagan and Gorbachev signed in 1987, dealing with Euro missiles. And then things snowballed in a positive way. And George H.W. Bush was the most successful president when it came to reducing nuclear danger and reaching agreements, a wide set of agreements, including two strategic arms reduction treaties, then things began to fall apart. Yes, uh, thank you for your answer. And for my next question, I'm quoting you from your books, page number five, Quote, the great success of arms control lie in the river view mirror, unquote. I'm curious to know which leader has the best river view mirror facility in their statecraft vehicle. Mr. Biden, Mr. Putin, Mr. Xi, or someone else? I, I think it's crucial that all of these leaders look in the rear view mirror in order to avoid nuclear danger. There are successful techniques. There are successful arrangements. Tacit agreements were a key part of success during the Cold War. Um, every national leader has a solemn obligation to avoid crimes against humanity and crimes against nature. And a nuclear war and a, with uncontrolled escalation will constitute crimes against humanity and nature. And we have to remind leaders of this often. Nobody wants to fight a nuclear war. Nobody wants to go there. Um, and we have to rebuild. We can't rebuild the same way. The structure that we rebuild will not replicate the structure that we had at the end of the Cold War because that structure involved, heavily involved treaties and treaties require the consent of two thirds of the senators present and voting on the treaty. And that is now very hard to see, um, at least under a democratic president. So treaties are gonna play less of a role in the rebuild. I think, Numbers will play less of a role in the rebuild. 
for two reasons, because we now have a three-party competition in strategic forces. And three-party numerical agreements are gonna be very, very hard to reach. If we reach them, it'll take time. And there'll be all kinds of fights along the way. What do we do in the meantime? And my argument in this book is that we really have to focus on norms moving forward. The norm of no use on battlefield. The norm of no testing. And I, I propose that we work very hard at two norms that have taken a beating. The norm that you do not threaten to use nuclear weapons on battlefields. And the norm of avoiding dangerous military practices. The last one's gonna be real. It's gonna take a lot of work. And we also have to figure out a way to bring India and Pakistan into this mix because the possibility of nuclear use uh, hasn't gone away on the subcontinent. And if countries are gonna clash on borders, disputed borders, we need to be creative about yet bringing India and Pakistan in. Thanks, Mr. Kipon. I appreciate that. Doc, you have a question. So would you like to ask? Or do you want me to read it? You're going to make me show my ugly mug on here again, aren't you? <laughs> okay, so I had a couple of questions, but I think maybe the one that, that would segue best here would be, um, you know, with, with all the irrational characters that are out there now that have nuclear capabilities <laughs> or, or are pursuing nuclear capabilities, uh, Pakistan, North Korea, uh, potentially Iran, uh, what kind of a monkey wrench does that throw into the, the ability then to talk about the norms and the values and, and the, you know, sticking to uh, commitments not to escalate to nuclear? It, it seems that that would be difficult to, to bring about uh, in, in the kind of environment where we have this sort of proliferation. Could you talk to, talk to us about that? Well, first, Doc, I want to remind younger people, people who are younger than you and me, uh, who might be listening in, that the situation looks grim, but it's been grimmer. It's been a lot grim in our past, and we've gotten through it. Uh, when President Johnson um, was persuaded to pursue the nonproliferation treaty, it was at a time after China had first tested nuclear weapons. Uh, people were worried that it could be 15 or 20 countries that decided they needed the bomb for their national security. And when the Non-Proliferation Treaty was first negotiated, it only had 62 signatories. Um, China didn't sign, France didn't sign, West Germany didn't sign. Some of our allies didn't sign. Um, lots of very important non-aligned states didn't sign. This treaty now has over 190 signatories. And all but one of them are um, respecting their obligations. Now, we've had one dropout. That matters greatly, North Korea. And Iran is flagrantly violating its obligations. The Iranian situation to me is critical. I say this because we now have four pairs of nuclear armed rivals. This is, this is worse than during the Cold War, when we had only one pair. Now we got four of them. U.S., Russia, China, U.S., China, India, India, Pakistan. Now, if Iran succeeds in being a threshold state, 
nuclear weapon it possesses in the state, or if it crashes through the threshold, we're going to have more than four nuclear armed rivals. We have an automatic fifth, Iran, Israel, and we're likely to have more. Saudi Arabia, certainly, um, almost certainly. Turkey, a real possibility. And perhaps other states in the Middle East. It's bad enough to have nuclear armed rivals in Southern Asia and confronting themselves at present with respect to Ukraine. If we have nuclear armed rivals in the Middle East as well, then that's a very serious and negative development. Um, but there are some, just to even out the picture a bit, Doc, um, after 9-11, we were completely consumed with the problem of nuclear armed terrorists. We were completely consumed with this problem after the Soviet Union imploded um, with enough fissile material to make God knows how many nuclear weapons. And the Soviet Union imploded when it had 30,000 of them. And, not, and the, the aspect of nuclear terrorism didn't actualize. That's a tremendous achievement. Uh, and that's no longer high anywhere up in the upper tier of our concerns at present. So the picture is worrisome for sure, but in some respects, it's been worse in the past. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doc, for your question. And thank you, Mr. Krupon. I have another question in chat box uh, uh, from Mr. Nathan Wilson. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, so uh, let me read the questions. As the, what are the statistical odds that nations like Taiwan could rig up a crude nuclear device over the course of a long weekend? If they think China will try its luck? Uh, I think the odds are very, very low. Um, uh, and pointing towards zero. Uh, acquiring nuclear weapons takes more than a weekend. Uh, uh, it usually takes a long number of years. Taiwan has had the, the ability to do so. It has the technological base. It has smart people, uh, but it doesn't have the infrastructure to do it. And building that infrastructure would take quite a long period of time. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Kipon. Uh, we have another question in our chat box uh, from our consortium member, Vineet. Vineet, would you like to ask the question? Uh, first of all, ma'am, uh, and uh, 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 Michael, sir, I would like to thank you all for this uh, discussion, insightful discussion. My question goes like this. With increased discussions of alliance-like structures such as the Quad and the recent uh, AUKUS, which happened, and evolving defense technologies in com contemporary times. Uh, what do you think about the role which deterrence could play with respect to rogue, sta uh, rogue states such as North Korea, Pakistan, and Iran? When the United States and China but deterrence alone is dangerous. It's meant to be dangerous. It's designed to be dangerous. 
Um, deterrence is all about threatening somebody. And if you don't threaten somebody, uh, deterrence isn't working. <laughs> so there are inherent dangers when you rely on deterrence, not just because it's dangerous, but because it fails. You know, deterrence has so far succeeded in the two worst possible cases. That is to say, uh, nuclear, it's prevented nuclear exchanges and it's prevented large scale conventional war to the extent that anybody's wished to do that. But so let's give deterrence credit for those things. But deterrence fails when it comes to lesser cases. The fact that India, for example, has nuclear weapons doesn't deter China from engaging in uh, land grabbing tactics along the line of actual control. And it doesn't prevent Pakistan from supporting uh, acts that lead to the loss of life in contested, in, you know, in the disputed area of Jammu and Kashmir, as well as in India proper. There have already been two border wars between nuclear armed rivals. They were 30 years apart. One was between China and the Soviet Union. One was between India and Pakistan over Cargill. Uh, so deterrence is not only dangerous, it also has a track record of failure. So you need something besides deterrence to prevent the use of nuclear weapons. You need arms control alongside deterrence in dealing with nuclear armed rivalry. And there's plenty of deterrence right now. And deterrence is growing right now. What's missing is the arms control piece. And that's what I focus on in my book. Thank you, Mr. Kapoor, uh, for your answer. And uh, thank you, Vineet, for asking the question. Uh, we have another question in our chat box uh, from our consortium member, Sunena. Uh, Sunena, would you like to ask your question? Uh, OK, the question is uh, like uh, uh, that, uh, uh, why do the South Asian nuclear processing states still remain as one of the unresolved issues in NPT. Despite of years of discussions and deliberations in the preceding RevCons, why has NPT led non-proliferations regime not been able to integrate these nations into the treaty or a parallel instrument per se? Uh, trying to fit India and Pakistan into the non-proliferation regime, I think will lead to failure. Certainly hasn't succeeded to date, as you know, and as you've noted in your question. I don't see how it works in the future. They don't fit. They tested nuclear weapons after the date in which the treaty acknowledged abs and ethnos. And to bring them into the treaty regime would also mean um, that other states could test nuclear weapons and expect similar treatment. And nobody wants that. So what I propose to do in the book is to create complementary structures to the NPT that do engage India and Pakistan. So I propose the creation of a new seven nation forum. So the P5 are there and we bring in India and Pakistan 
And we have all seven sit at the table. Now, I would propose that the subject matter of discussion be norms and only norms. I would propose that the agenda for this seven nation forum forbid the tabling of a bilateral dispute. Absolutely forbid. Although the seven nation forum could encourage sidebar conversations between countries that are enmeshed in hard disputes and that don't talk to one another in substantive ways through any other diplomatic channels. And I think India and Pakistan would agree to sit in a seven nation forum. It would be, it would add to their status and status is important to countries. Uh, the question is, will China sit at the table? <laughs> That's the hard question. Pakistan would love to sit at this table. But if China says no, then Pakistan says no. Um, we've got to figure out creative ways to get China involved in, in strategic stability talks. I would do so over norms. And I would propose a seven nation forum because the P5, that's yesterday's news. We have to expand it. Nuclear dangers, are uh, rising in Southern Asia. We have to include Southern Asia in conversations about norm building. And China doesn't like to be the odd nation out. It doesn't. It doesn't like to be the stick in the mud, as we say, to use a, an American idiom. Maybe a seven nation forum can help bring China in. It's an idea. It would be very hard to execute, but it's worth thinking about. Thanks, Mr. Kipon. My next question is uh, about that you suggested the alternative approach uh, to revive arms control in the form of three norms, no use of nuclear weapons in warfare, no further testing, and no proliferation. At this point, when US foreign policy is <laughs> lacking its vision in Afghanistan and sort of focused on Indo-Pacific, rather I would say uh, countering China, how do you assess the threat of nuclear terrorism in a very volatile and fragile APEC region when Taliban is again in power? As I told Doc, I, I think the threat of nuclear terrorism is much reduced, much reduced, even with the advent of the Taliban in Afghanistan. Um, and there will be ungovernable spaces in Afghanistan. There always have been. There will be challenges to the Taliban. Um, they're going to have their hands full. I don't believe they know how to govern and they don't have the means to go. Uh, acquiring nuclear weapons is probably not high up on their list of priorities. And they could rely on a much relaxed nuclear security culture in Pakistan, the first time around. And Pakistan has changed its security culture. And they're way better at protecting their nuclear assets and fissile material. So I'm not worried about that as much as I'm worried about other things. But I've forgotten to mention something that's really important in here. When we talk about Mormba, it's in the book, but I have forgotten to mention it in this conversation. 
it's not just you don't use nuclear weapons in warfare. It's not just that you don't test. It's not just no further nuclear proliferation. And I do want to reduce threats of use. And I obviously want to reduce dangerous military practices. But it's hard to reduce dangerous military practices if the norm of respecting the national sovereignty and territorial integrity of your neighbors is being cut to ribbons. Um, the norm of respect for territorial integrity and national sovereignty is crucial to conditions of nuclear peace, crucial. So we also need the norm and the focus on the norm of you don't change borders that you dispute by force of arms. You don't change them by force of arms. This habit of strong states disregarding the territorial integrity and national sovereignty of weak states was part and parcel of acceptable behavior prior to World War II. And powerful states would gobble up weak states for lunch. And that's what led to World War II. And after World War II, the norm of respecting territorial integrity and national sovereignty took hold for a while. And now it is in danger. And it's most specifically in danger with respect to Ukraine at this moment. And that's why I urge the younger people who are tuning in to stay focused on what's going on in Ukraine. Because how this crisis, and it is a crisis, plays out will affect our future. Thank you, sir, like uh, for your wonderful insight and for your valuable time uh, uh, to be here. It's time to wrap up and uh, uh, I would recommend everyone to, for the student researcher and practitioner to, if they are interested in the topic and the subject to read this book and buy this book, it's a must read book. And uh, I would like to invite uh, our director for his final remarks here. Doc, over to you. Thanks, Indu. And, and thank you, Mr. Crepin. This was just fantastic. I'm, I'm, you know, I've enjoyed all of them, but this was very engaging and uh, you know, very uh, keen insights. Uh, you know, I'm terrified about what's going on in Ukraine, uh, obviously, uh, and terrified about the precedent that it will set. And, you know, if, if things uh, go south there and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's almost like we're back at a, at a Munich uh, agreement sort of situation where if we don't uh, provide some uh, backbone in the face of, of Putin's aggressions, it's going to just spiral out of control. You know, it's set a dangerous precedent for Taiwan. Uh, but anyway, uh, without opening up the can of worms, thank you so much for for the uh, the very uh, informative and and uh, entertaining, uh, although it's entertaining and and uh, and in such a depressing topic and everything uh, can can sometimes be. Uh, uh, a misnomer, but uh, it, it was entertaining at the same time. And, uh, you know, very much appreciated you know, your ability to, to draw on the history. Um, I'd love to have you back on. So maybe you could at, at some point discuss, you know, what exactly went wrong once the Clinton administration took power. You, you talked about that's when things started to, to kind of go 
the other direction. So we'd definitely love to have a follow up with you at some point. And uh, again, uh, thank you, and thank you, Andrew, for uh, you know setting up these wonderful uh, venues for us to to have experts like Mr. Crepin on to inform, as, especially our younger audience, but also our, our decision makers that are out there. That I, I hope uh, from a time to time we'll, we'll uh, you know watch these videos and, and maybe uh, pause to think every once in a while instead of just knee jerk reactions. Um, interesting concept, I know, in in, in politics. Um, but at any rate, uh, thank you again, uh, for, for, and thank you to our audience for uh, being here and also for participating. We had some very good questions from the audience. Happy to see some of our consortium folks here. That's fantastic. And uh, turn it back over to you, Indu. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gipon, once again for your valuable time and for your wonderful insight. Thank you all attendees for joining us today, making it a successful event. And let's hope for New Year 2020, open the norm book, adopt and ratify to reduce the nuclear danger and have a great day. <laughs>